Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Crash Course Economics. It's really nice to see you again or to welcome you for the first time. My name is Sarah. I'm the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at TNI, the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez. He's a researcher at SOMO. Uh, and behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Krollsmith, Kees Hudig, and Ulona Hartleaf, who are working very hard to make this already third session a great success. So uh, the five of us are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we decided to unite at the start of the Corona crisis to reflect on what's going on and which challenges um, lie ahead of us. So to tell you a little bit about Crash Course, what is Crash Course? Uh, well, Crash Course is a platform which is designed to uh, open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also take the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. Uh, to achieve this purpose, we are inviting global experts uh, to break down complex issues and make them accessible to a broader public so we can understand what's going on and how to shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. So uh, our goal is to democratize knowledge and also provide you with the necessary tools to change the world with that knowledge. Uh, and our method is really going to the heart of, of, of complex problems and trying to put forward thorough and uh, future-proof solutions. Good for you to know is uh, every session we make a recording. Um, we will put it on our website later on. There's also a podcast version available for you and also a transcript or a summary of today's sessions with uh, the best highlights. Um, so in the next sessions, we might discuss different topics, which might be feminist economics, global debt, or the Green Deal, but this very first series is about monetary policy, and I'd like Rodrigo to give the floor to explain a little bit what we're discussing. Well, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so this uh, first series uh, on Crash Course is on uh, monetary policy, central banks, and ideology, uh, and we have organized it in four separate sessions, uh, and this is the third session. Um, so last week, we had uh, Benjamin Brown with us, and we had a, a very interesting session um, on the, yeah, the interdependence between central banks and, uh, and actors in financial markets, how they co-evolve, co uh, and how central banks essentially need uh, large uh, asset manager, investment funds, banks, uh, well, to execute uh, their, their power. Um, and as a result of this, uh, these large actors on financial markets have infrastructural power. Um, uh, and, and a very interesting uh, point that Benjamin Brown made was that this infrastructural power is strongest in the core uh, of the financial system. And um, so today we will focus uh, on the periphery, uh, spatially that is. Uh, we will focus on uh, how um, well, central bank activity, central bank policy in the north affects the global south. Right. Thanks, Rodrigo. So I'll tell you a little bit about the practicalities of this webinar. Um, the setup is as following. So uh, at first we had uh, Gieke Tano, who was supposed to present his views on the effects of uh, monetary policy in the global south today. But um, he's unfortunately not able to take part this time, and we hope to welcome him on another occasion. But we are very much delighted that uh, Pablo Bortz uh, is able to uh, share his views with us, and he will be introduced shortly. Um, and instead of giving a presentation, uh, Rodrigo and I will immediately start with interviewing him. And this part of the webinar will take half an hour, 35 minutes more or less. And thereafter, we reserve enough time for you uh, as attendees uh, to um, pose your questions. Uh, you can do that by uh, posing your question in the special Q&A tab, which you will find in the lower half of your Zoom screen. Um, and if you like a question, you can actually endorse it by putting a thumbs up. So in that sense, there will uh, arise a system of uh, yeah, democratic question posing, uh, and the best questions will pop up at first, and then Rodrigo and I will read them uh, out loud. So, Rodrigo, will you introduce uh, our guest of today? Yes, well, um, Pablo Bortz is currently a professor of uh, macroeconomics at the University of San Martin. He lives in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, he's joining us today from uh, Buenos Aires. 
um, previously, uh, he also worked at the Ministry of Finance, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Foreign Affairs, uh, and at the Central Bank in, in Argentina. So next to uh, academia, he is also uh, well, well informed of the, the world of practice. Um, well, and as such, he is also, of course, experienced uh, uh, many of the types of problems that uh, Argentina experienced in the last uh, few years. Uh, and well, we believe that makes him a, a very interesting guest to have uh, on Crash Course. Um, so um, because Pablo Bort, um well, joined us so recently, he didn't have time to prepare a presentation. Uh, and so what we agreed on is to have a, an extended interview, essentially. Uh, well, hello, Pablo. Hello. hello. Um, Thanks for the invitation. Yes. Uh, uh, so Pablo also informed us that uh, uh, there might be two cats that uh, may maybe jump yes. on the screen so that people don't uh, uh, well get very jumpy of it. Um, so be before we before we get to the um, the heart of the matter uh, of today, that is the how monetary policy in the north affects uh, the global south. Um, we would like to discuss some well, some basic issues uh, that allow that would allow people to better understand the problem. Uh, so, um, one of the questions I, I would like to start with is um, the, the type of financial integration of developing countries in the global south, uh, the type of financial integration that they have uh, in the global uh, financial markets. Um, and one aspect, one aspect of that is um, what is the hierarchy of money? Uh, why is the, the hegemony of the dollar so, um, so important? And, and why does it matter if a country uh, is unable to emit bonds or sell bonds in its domestic currency, but has to sell it in euros or dollars? So basically, to tie this uh, a larger question uh, to more simply um, what is the hierarchy of money and, and what does it tell us about the type of integration in the financial system of the global south well uh, we could define uh, the what is the currency hierarchy as uh, the power the command that your currency can have on goods assets um, on uh, credit now, uh, the dollar is, is at the top of this hierarchy because uh, most of the of trade is denominated in dollars, even though you do not trade with the US. Let's say we tr Argentina trades with some other countries, that trade is denominated in dollars and you need dollars to pay for them. Um, a lot of credit is denominated in dollars, even if it is not uh, lent by US institutions. Then um, dollar takes part in, a, in the larger share of, um, of financial transactions. So uh, dollar is present uh, in, in, in the larger share, and it's the currency of denomination of, uh, of most of the transactions, real and financial, around the world. Uh, second come a different, uh, some, uh, some other currencies, let's say the Euro, the Japanese Yen, which also have a, 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 a substantial power. Particularly, I would say regionally, the yen in uh, in Asia, the euro in Europe, um, Eastern Europe, a bit in Africa as well, north of Africa. But uh, all, globally speaking, it is the dollar because, like I say, uh, it's the uh, currency of denomination of most transactions. It's the currency of funding it's the it's the money you use to buy other things either real either stuff or assets <coughs> but, in sorry, other parts but, of the world but could you 
explain what the risks are for a country to borrow sure. in dollars as opposed to borrowing in uh, well, domestic currency? Well, the risk is basically that uh, you run out of dollars when it comes to the time of paying that, uh, that debt. Uh, that's a basic risk for thing, uh, for other reasons. Uh, let's say you have either a capital flight, or investors pull out their money, pull their money out of the country, or you have a, a trade deficit. There is a variety of reasons for which it's not that you lack um, resources to pay that debt; it's that you lack the dollars. In a sense, it's uh, similar to think about it as a instead of a gold standard, a dollar standard. In so the gold you need, standard, you need dollars. You need dollars to, to repay the dollar denominated debt. Exactly. If if it is denominated in your own currency, you can always print your currency. It might have other side effects, which we could talk about it or not. But with dollars, you cannot print it unless you are the US. Or you yes. get the US money printing machine, uh, which, is, which comes through other... Um, channels that perhaps we will discuss it uh, later on but as, as long as you can't print dollars uh, you uh, you will have a harder time paying dollar debt that's the basic uh, basic idea about it yeah. about the risks Sara would you like to continue yeah so uh, since we're already discussing that a little bit um, maybe we could discuss the build-up of debt in the global south Pablo so uh, global debt in general has reached records right so uh, yep. at, at the moment it's about 255 trillion uh, which is really substantially more than when the financial crisis began and also developing countries and emerging economies uh, have very high high debt piles uh, and part of this, I mean, that has many reasons, of course, but part of this has to do with uh, quantitative easing or monetary policy, because hot money is flowing also into peripheral uh, systems. Can you explain a little bit um, how monetary policies uh, in the global north, mainly, so US and EU, affect uh, the global south in, in general? How does that work? Well, uh, the monetary policy, and uh, let's broadly call the financial conditions in the global north, affect the terms, the conditions in which the global south has access to this dollar funding or euro funding, independently of the conditions in the recipient economy. I think uh, so. Let's uh, so it's not that the conditions in Brazil determine where Brazil has access or not, or, or South Africa or whatever, but what happens in the, in, in the US financial system, in, a, in, the Euro, uh, in the Eurozone financial system, that determines whether other countries can access or not um, a, the external borrowing, dollar borrowing, euro borrowing. So whenever uh, there is, um, let's call excess liquidity or, or very lax uh, risk perceptions, like there is a lot of money going on. Excess liquidity, can you explain that? What does that mean? A, lot of money, a lot of money flowing around, mm -hmm. searching for uh, higher returns. Mm -hmm. uh, south in that, in that scenario, countries from the south, they usually get a lot of money. It's easier for them to borrow dollars. And in, in let's say since the global financial crisis, a lot of countries, a lot of companies from southern countries have been borrowing abroad at these easier terms, easier, condi luxer, uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin is that um, whenever there, are, there is a tightening of monetary policy, of risk perceptions in the north, uh, money flows out of uh, southern economies, of the global south, and heads into the US, independently, again, of the conditions in the global south. I mean, 
some countries may be having a, a fine situation and suddenly they are uh, faced with massive outflows of which, of which they are not responsible and have barely any control. That's basically the, the interactions between the monetary policies. And that is reflected in exchange rates. Mm -hmm. uh, that is reflected in, um, in What does it mean? So when it, it's reflected in exchange rate, uh, where, uh, whenever the money flows in, whenever money flows in, uh, your exchange rate appreciates your currency rise in value, and when money flows out, uh, your currency depreciates. That can have repercussions on uh, on prices, uh, on on income distribution, etc. And like I say, independently of your domestic conditions, that's the major uh, problem. Um, so yeah, uh, there is a lot of, uh, then there is another influence, an uh, indirect influence, which is on commodity prices. Many countries right. in, the global, in the global south, they export commodities, minerals, agricultural products, uh, and the price of this is also of these uh, commodities is also influenced by the liquidity conditions abroad because they became uh, like a, an asset in which to invest. So whenever there is a lot of liquidity, the price of this commodity goes up, and whenever there is a tightening of um, of conditions, the price goes down, independently of the conditions in the in the periphery. Right, so you explain these different mechanisms, exchange rate yes. mechanisms, commodity price mechanisms. And can you um, elaborate a little bit on, on how the QE policies after the financial crisis uh, led to growing debt levels in the global south? Well, uh, uh, first the United States, uh, the US implemented uh, different uh, phases, uh, stages of QE, of quantitative easing. Uh, first, in order to basically rescue the financial system, to, to let's say, to remove toxic assets, these lo non-performing loans, let's call it, uh, these uh, securities, these uh, mortgage-backed securities, etc., from the banks, so to remove them from, from them, and then, to uh, start, uh, the idea was to, uh, be, to, to try to incentivize investors into going to riskier assets. To, let's say, to say, there will be, um, you will have a lot of money and not many things to, in which to invest your money in the US, in this country, so you better go into riskier assets. And those riskier assets, uh, many of them are in the periphery. So between, let's say, 2000, 2009 and 2013, 14, there was a huge inflow of, um, of external liquidity of money from abroad mm -hmm. into emerging economies. And uh, particularly many firms, more, more than government, it was firms in the global non-financial corporations. Yeah, so corporate uh, debt, right? Corporate debt that uh, took profit from these lax conditions abroad and uh, they borrow heavily. heavily. Um, after that, there came a period of what we, let's say, ebb and flow, like short-term cycles. There was what we call the Tupper Tantrum in the end of uh, 2013, in which the, the Federal Reserve said, we are thinking about starting to tightening the, to, to tighten the monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And, what would, and uh, what would that mean if you tighten the monetary policy? Was uh, it to stop QE, to reverse QE. Right. To so sto stop, uh, stop, um, buying assets and injecting liquidity and start to withdraw liquidity. Yeah, so it's less money from... Exactly, yeah. to withdraw money. We are starting to think about it, they mm -hmm. say. 
and that's a uh, shockwave uh, through all emerging economies. And uh, so they started this period of uh, how fast the Fed is tightening. If it is not tightening too fast, then we have a, a, a another period of liquidity flowing into emerging economies. And if it's uh, speeding up, then there is an outflow. So there came this period of uh, ebb and flows, shorter cycles of liquidity up until uh, the, the, the birth of this uh, of the coronavirus uh, pandemia, in which, um, well, there actually is a good example because there was a massive outflow of uh, money from emerging economies, like a hundred billion dollars in two months. Uh, it was unprecedented. At the beginning uh, of the Corona at crisis. The begin, uh, at the beginning of the Corona crisis, mm -hmm. unprecedented. Uh, even uh, larger than in the global financial crisis. But then the, Fed, the Federal Reserve stepped in and started to provide liquidity again, not only in the US, but also to many other emerging economies. So now it, the cycle is reversing and we are seeing, starting to see an inflow of, um, of uh, money, of dollars into uh, several emerging economies again. So maybe, maybe if, if I can uh, intervene. Um, so if we look at uh, the current situation, we've seen the, the period from after the global financial crisis, 2007-2008, a long period of uh, asset purchases by uh, central banks in the global north, uh, which led to uh, flows going to the global south growing debt in the global south and then we have this COVID 19 crisis in march we see this massive drop and then a uh, return of uh, money in in the global south indicating the the powerful role that the federal reserve has and the, and the powerful tools it has um, but what what does this indicate of the of the period we are in because uh, if we look at the uh, 1980s, uh, there was also uh, a debt crisis, uh, but uh, the, the, the most important players in that period were the banks. Uh, and uh, this had a certain dynamic of how to resolve the crisis. Uh, in the 1990s, it was a, a separate actors again. Uh, and now at the heart of the, of the debt, of the, of the growing debt and how it, uh, moved from the system in the global north to this global south is the bond market, uh, and so how is how is a, a, a crisis, a debt crisis for developing countries different when it is situated in the bond market as opposed to uh, a banking system or bank bank led crisis in the 1980s? That is a great question. First, uh, let's start by the 1980s. Uh, what, um, in that period, after the Volcker sho uh, shock, when the US increased its interest rate to 20%, uh, many, all Latin American economies went into a default. And that's what it, the, the, um, the Latin American debt crisis of the, of the 1980s. If the Latin American countries did not pay their debt, uh, the financial system of the US uh, would have collapsed because uh, all the creditors were banks. Now, in the, in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, creditors were um, bonds were financial investors, not mainly banks, um, but they were a very um, small, how to, no, I, want, I don't want to say they were small, they, there were many bond investors, many. So on one side, they didn't have a, what we say, a, a systemic relevance, each individually considered, uh, but on the other hand, it was more difficult to uh, agree with each and every one 
uh, given the type of contracts of the debt of the bonds for in case of uh, of need for a, a debt restructuring um, so you have to negotiate with a larger group while in the 80s you have to face four banks right mm. so uh, there, yeah there uh, there are very different of power um, so it's a it's a different situation you have you must face a lot of people so you must contemplate and satisfy them all and there are many more not just four or five nowadays it's a mixture because yes you have a, a there is a growing importance of bond debt relatively to a, to a bank debt bond debt is much more important nowadays but unlike the uh, early 2000s, the um, uh, investors are also concentrated. You have huge asset managers. The asset management industry is very concentrated with, let's, with three, four players concentrating like 60% of the assets. So uh, in, in that regard, it's similar to uh, to the conditions in the 80s, in the 1980s, in that very regard that the uh, that investors are concentrated. But nowadays, the third difference is that the, uh, these um, asset managers are even more powerful that were uh, that than what banks were in the 1980s. Much can you powerful. can you name a few of those asset managers? BlackRock, uh, Pimco. Uh, well, Argentina has problems with Fidelity, um, uh, Templeton. So um, let's say if you name ten, that's a lot of money. Some that uh, really are, are are very astonishing. So. Uh, they do have a lot of power in this moment and for the future because it's not likely that let's say uh, that banks will step in in the future to to reverse this trend no and you will why, still why have it, to why is it the problem that they have a lot of power you think well uh, uh, for instance uh, in this pandemic um, in this crisis um, a lot of african countries uh, which have borrowed a lot, Ghana, Nigeria, um, Angola, uh, they are facing massive balance of payment problems because of all these uh, outflows of dollars. Yeah, so balance of payment problem is they cannot repay their debts, right? Exactly, they, they don't have the dollars to repay the debt and, and also pay for imports and all the things that they, that they need to, to for normal economic activity. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was this talk of a debt standstill, not to pay debt for, let's say, a year or so until the crisis is solved. Okay, uh, this, but, is the uh, G, G, this is the G20 proposal? Exactly, the, no. and even the IMF uh, uh, is favoring, is advising a standstill. It's advising no. a standstill for private investors. But private investors don't want to hear about it. Don't want to hear yeah. about it. Period. So, so just just to be clear, a, a debt standstill is uh, not is, paying. It's a it's a pause. It's a break. It's a break from exactly. Uh, but but it's not uh, it's not a jubilee. It's not a no 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 no. You still you will still have to pay your debt later. Yeah. yeah. That's the that's a simple basic idea. Uh, but uh, private investors uh, they don't want to hear about it. So but now now we are at thing. at this point. Maybe uh, I know um, it, uh, we can talk about this for a long, long time. Uh, 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 and, uh, I know you're uh, um, an expert on this, but yeah, I would, I would like to ask you to, to be brief, if it's possible. Is the, the is the Argentinian the latest episode of the Argentinian uh, debt crisis? Um, so the Argentine, the latest debt crisis uh, in Argentina. In the Netherlands, for example, of course, the Netherlands is a country, uh, uh, me and, and Sarah, we are uh, in the Netherlands. 
uh, you know, uh, this is the country of uh, Dijsselbloem. Of uh, uh, it's a it's 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 very much part of the problem. Uh, it's position it takes in, in the IMF, um, being also a big tax haven. It's problematic in many ways. But so the narrative in the Netherlands, uh, in the mainstream media, uh, maybe Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically ah, it's another crisis in Argentina. It's always the same. Uh, there's nothing new. They're uh, lazy, right? Yeah, uh, uh, can, can you can can you can you tell us if uh, uh, something about the origins of this latest uh, crisis in Argentina, how, where it comes from, and also uh, what role the IMF played in um, making it worse? Uh, yes, uh, the crisis uh, has similarities with very with uh, other episodes in previous history, uh, particularly the financial deregulation, the opening of the of the of, uh, of the financial system to uh, foreign investors, borrowing a lot in dollars. Uh, one new characteristic, uh, which was actually the um, the precedent for what we are seeing in this corona in coronavirus crisis, is the importance of foreign investors in some particularly uh, peso denominated markets, some debt of the central bank, short term debt that investors use for carry trade purposes. They borrowed abroad in dollars, they invested in our currency, they earn a huge interest rate, plus during a time an appreciation of the peso, and then they flew out of the country. When they flew out, we had a crisis in, 2000, in April 2018. So there is this mix of traditional and new elements of, a, of a, um, of a balance of payment crisis. The IMF, what it did was, uh, it did provide a lot of money, more than, I mean, it, it was um, the, the biggest uh, IMF loan in its history, uh, in, in absolute terms. 50 billion. Uh, uh, the program uh, initially was 50, it was extended to 56. But not all the money was disbursed eventually, not all of it, only 44, of only 44 billion. Um, it had a, a usual IMF uh, stabilization program, which involves cutting expenditure. Um, eventually, they increase uh, some taxes. Uh, but it cut expenditure, expenditure a lot. It stopped uh, the, the financial assistance, the monetary financing of the deficit from the central bank. Um, but it didn't put any control on uh, capital outflows. It didn't put any, um, any role for the stabilization of the exchange rate, which is very important in Argentina. If the exchange rate fluctuates, it only fluctuates upwards. So it really usually depreciates, which creates more inflation and more problems in this country. So, uh, and it only, and the money that was lent was used for um, paying debt and financing capital outflows. So the money was not used to, to improve the economy, to improve investment. Investment was curtailed, was really cut all the budget for public investment. So it really didn't, uh, it really, it didn't provide any, it, it worsened the crisis and didn't provide any basis for a recovery. That's what but, happened. You know, if, if I may um, try to summarize it, if I, if I understand it well, uh, at the heart of the problem was this carry trade that you make use of the difference between the interest rates externally in dollars or in euro that is uh, much lower and internally in Argentina that is much higher uh, mm. and th this yes. caused an inflow yes. and later an outflow of money Yes. and when that the money flew out uh, the, the, the response of the IMF was uh, to, to put to give money for the short run, but yes. basically to destroy the local economy, uh, expenditure yeah. by the government was uh, reduced, uh, wages uh, declined, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, causing a big yeah. economic crisis, uh, while yes. not stopping 
the money flowing out of the country that no, has not at all. created the problem. Exactly. There were basically three causes. One was the carry trade. The second was the foreign uh, borrowing in dollars. And the third one was a persistent capital outflow, uh, dollar outflow by uh, residents, by Argentinians, which actually increased when the IMF stepped in. So uh, instead of uh, calming things, of cooling things down, the, um, when, when we had the agreement with the IMF, uh, things turned even for the worse. So, so uh, the IMF didn't solve any of the city problems. Maybe uh, before we move on to, to the next session or the next part of our, our questions. Uh, so it's not the first time that the IMF um, has oh. tabled these policies, right? So no. at some point you, you would think that also an institution has some kind of uh, learning capacities and, and you yeah. know, draws lessons from the past. Why didn't this happen? I mean, it was yeah. this was after the Greek crisis, right? Where yeah, yes. Greece was also uh, really badly treated, amongst others, by the IMF. Uh, yeah, really screwing up uh, their economy. So yeah, what 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 happened there? I mean, or what didn't happen there? Why why isn't any institutional change taking place there? Well, uh, the IMF replicated what happened in other crises. They are uh, two, three years later, they, I'm sure they will come with a, an independent evaluation saying, mm. oh, we screwed it up again. Uh, yeah. They did it after a 2001 crisis and they did it every time, two, three years after a crisis, they say, well, we screwed it up. Uh, part, is, um, part of this is because of the, um, well, geopolitics, creditors' power. Uh, part of it is because of the thinking uh, within the IMF, the economic uh, framework they use, which has not changed a single bit, I would say, in ever, uh, in, in, in 40 years. It's still uh, the one, uh, the same recipe for all crises. Um, so uh, there are a lot of barriers for a uh, reform of the IMF from within and from with uh, and from uh, outside, from the inside and the outside. Uh, geopolitically speaking, um, the IMF is all, uh, uh, is basically ruled. I mean, the main uh, influence is uh, is from the US. European countries have a say. Japan have a say. Increasingly, China have, a, have a, has a voice, but still, uh, especially in Latin America, uh, the U.S. is, is the ruler. Uh, and it's not a matter of uh, improving things in the recipient economy. It's a matter of, uh, for a while, letting uh, private investors to cash in and then, yes, we can have a, a debt restructuring, a default, a, a haircut, what we call in the, in the debt. But first, they have to cash, uh, investors have to cash in, uh, like, like it happened in Greece and in, in Argentina as well uh, pre, in previous times. Sorry, I, I don't want to cut it short, but I think that we have two questions uh, that we still would really like to address before we move on to the Q&A session uh, of the people attending uh, this webinar. Uh, Sarah, would you like to continue? Yeah, so um, moving towards uh, conclusions a little bit, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about capital controls uh, as a means to uh, control the amount of, of money within your country. So what are the capital controls? Um, what are the main times for incoming flows or outgoing flows? And could you name some uh, examples? Yes, uh, for inflows, usually uh, you have, for instance, um, Chile implemented a tax on external borrowing for its mm -hmm. private company. Uh, Brazil also implemented a tax on uh, investment in derivative markets, which was quite innovative. Uh, there is a usual instrument which is called uh, unremunerated reserve requirements, which is uh, you buy, let's say you an American buy an asset, uh, 
or put a, a term deposit in Chile or Colombia, uh, you must put the double of money and that double part will not earn any interest. So overall, you are earning less. That's one of the typical instruments. Um, also, or you must put your money for a minimum of period, not 30 days, but no, no shorter than one year, for instance. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you, uh, you, you discourage uh, inflows. For outflows, it's, uh, you must, for uh, examples are, you must pay a tax to, to, um, to buy dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only acquire dollars for certain type of transactions and not others. Um, you, it, that has other side, side effects, but if you what if your intent is to keep the dollars in, that makes the trick. Um, so there are different uh, different alternatives according to, to each uh, situation. And actually a good thing is to go changing your, your controls, not to get married with one. Right, because yeah, so conditions different options. Changing. Yes, yes. So maybe um, I can already pose one question from the Q&A because it's directly linked to this topic. Uh, it's by uh, Josje Beukema. Welcome on the show, Josje. Um, considering the massive concentration of investors and the power these few players have, Josje asks, are there any initiatives to regulate this? Is it even possible to do this on a national level or only on an international level? So if I, if I translate it a little bit freely, what's the sovereignty of states to uh, impose, for example, capital controls? Or do we need a new framework uh, on which the IMF and other institutions agree before countries can do this? How does that function in practice? In practice, I think there is a, there is a policy space for capital controls. Uh, I'm quite a supporter of them. As I say, um, for instance, uh, Brazil implemented a, in the period of, of high inflows of money, quite innovative capital controls. Um, you can also put some controls, for instance, on your domestic banks to not borrow abroad or to not accept dollar deposits. or there are different things you can do. But um, going specifically to the question, um, individual countries, particularly from the South, can do very little against the power of, a, of a, these big asset managers. I mean, uh, now the Fed is relying on BlackRock to even implement its, uh, its monetary policy. So the level of power that these institutions, that these funds have is, uh, is uh, very, very large. And uh, uh, small countries from, uh, from the periphery can do very little, for instance, in what regards uh, debt restructuring or, or things like that. Uh, it must, there must be a coordinated response, but it's very unlikely that, uh, that it will take place. It's really, really unlikely. So essentially what you're saying is that um, the fun the financial globalization that we're living in, uh, we've been, it has been developing for the last 40 years. Mm. Um, at the heart of it, of course, is the mobility of capital. Yes. Uh, this is such a big structural phenomenon uh, uh, so institutionally, uh, deeply institutionally bounded in, in so many countries that it is very hard or impossible for independent uh, countries from the global south to well, take steps on their own. Yes. That, uh, that, yes, uh, yes. that uh, uh, this is a question about the architecture uh, totally. of, of how we organize uh, uh, global finance. And, and in that, <clears throat> sorry, in that respect, um, yeah, maybe we can go to um, yeah, a, 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 a final question um, <clears throat> to, to have some time left for, for, for a Q&A session. If we think of this uh, current situation uh, characterized by uh, free flow of money, this wall mm. of money just looking 
anywhere mm. where it can create returns if it's on food or oil or yes. debt from emerging market economies or housing in in the in in, in any housing market in the world uh, it it just goes anywhere it's just financializing many different parts of our economies yes. uh, how how could can we think of monetary policy in the global north uh, in the for example uh, in the eurozone in the federal reserve uh, uh, that is currently uh, yeah purchasing assets having these large q uh, qe uh, uh, programs how can we think of qe programs that uh, do not harm uh, the global south in terms of creating strengthening this massive uh, wall of money that is uh, looking for anywhere that it can create returns because it, it if we think of it it seems that uh, these qe programs by definition create uh, problems perhaps unintended but uh, create mm. uh, problems for for the global south or can we think of ways in which this would not be the case uh, i think there are uh, three things very quickly to go first uh, there must be a better regulation what of what we call this uh, shadow banking or uh, non-banking institutions, asset managers, and through other funds and instruments. There has to be a better regulation of what they can do and cannot do with the money. Uh, second is, um, well, uh, one channel that ca could be very useful for emerging economies is through um, this SDR, the currency of the IMF. Which, Can you explain uh, that? How does it yes. work? Yes, uh, all the countries that belong to the IMF and there are, or every in the ever in, even emerging and developed countries. Almost all, right? Or, almost all, like a lot of countries, they have access to um, and they use this IMF currency called the um, special, special uh, drawing rights. Special drawing rights. Um, the point is emerging markets use their mo that money and convert it into dollars, which they use to pay for imports and debt. But for advanced economies, it's lying there idle. They don't use it for anything. They don't need so they it, are, right? They don't need it, so right. they don't use it. So one idea is for them to lend this money or, or to um, emerging economies that actually need them at the moment. Or they could give it. Give it, a, or, there can, or there can be an increase in sovereign the, in, in SDRs. There can be a, an increase in the volume of the SDR. That's another possibility. A third one, very unlikely, is to have a, a, a rethink, a restructure of uh, the international financial system, international financial and monetary system, uh, putting uh, China in the table, putting um, creating better mechanisms to cope with this balance of payment crisis, but very utopical to think about it in, in, in these days. Well, yeah. China doesn't think it's very utopic. I think China is taking quite some steps, right? So It's taking steps, yes, but it's not challenging directly the role of the dollar so far. Mm. And so <clears throat> I think that's, um, well, there's still so much we uh, could discuss uh, in this corner of uh, alternatives. Uh, um, yes. But because of the time, I think it would be good to start uh, going through some uh, questions that were posed by uh, people. Uh, so I, I, I would like to start with a, a question by um, uh, Joost Kiertz. Um, he asks some, uh, uh, about actors that we have not discussed yet. Uh, uh, is that, what is the role of the large multinationals in this crisis, in this story, in this financial crisis, so we have, you, you have only talked about finance as if there's no real economy and no. Uh, but what is the role of multinational corporations? Um, I think uh, they are have they, uh, they have uh, had two roles. First, they have been acting also as asset managers as well. There have been, it's, it's particularly uh, even multinationals coming from the south, but also from the north. Uh, the um, the part of uh, of their companies that deals with money with debts and assets has increased. Uh, nowadays, they have been, uh, at the beginning of the Corona crisis, they have been stripped of cash. I mean, they have just stopped operating in many cases, 
and her ha uh, they have a, they have a, a, a huge demand for cash for paying uh, things for paying their employees etc and the that's why they they lay off uh, a, a lot of people. Now unemployment is very large everywhere, and uh, and they took profit from the from the monetary policy, the liquidity injection of the of the Federal Reserve. I think those are mainly the channel. I don't think I think they have they have had a, a significant impact on unemployment. And uh, and uh, even taking money out of emerging economies from their subsidiaries, etc. And uh, on the implementation of monetary policy, the effect that it will become so unequal that they capture a lot of money from what the Fed and other banks, uh, central banks, gave injected in terms mm. of liquidity. Yeah, maybe. Uh... Another question, would you, would you like to do that, Sarah? Sure, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of questions actually um, regarding uh, countries in, in Latin America. Um, so one of them is by Ruben Alderete. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, a lot of countries, uh, he writes, in South America had been lowering the interest rates and the reserve requirements to incentivize borrowing and investment. How can that policies work? In a scenario of uncertainty like the one we are living in, or maybe the question is, can those policies work in a situation of uncertainty that we're living in? Um, the effect depends. There are two sides to the reply. First, the effect depends on global conditions. For instance, if you lower uh, interest rates in an environment in which other countries are, uh, in which the U.S. is lowering the interest rate that can have an impact on the terms in which uh, your uh, your firm's access finance can have an access to finance i'm usually skeptical a bit about the influence of uh, lower interest rates on investment i usually think that investment is mainly driven by demand by domestic demand external demand but it can alleviate, uh, alleviate in, in at least in the short period um, some financial constraints, of course. So actually, the the the, the effect does not depend mainly on, on on domestic conditions. It depends on external conditions, and um, that's why this volatility is so damaging, right? Uh, this cycles of uh, tightening and, and relaxing last two months, uh, we, uh, last three months. So there is a lot of uncertainty, which reduces the, the effectiveness, effectiveness of this low interest rate policy. Because risks are even higher, are, yeah. are much increased. Shall I uh, pose another question? Uh, so I have a question by uh, uh, Lisandro. Uh, Maspero, also hope I pronounce his uh, name uh, uh, right. Uh, so uh, he refers to Argentina uh, uh, and having in mind that in the last two years uh, there was uh, a restricting of a restricted monetary policy uh, uh, and no con no uh, controls in exchange markets, and this resulted in a really bad uh, uh, social economic in a really really bad social economic downturn. So. How would it be possible, he asked, uh, to build a debt market in pesos, in Argentinian pesos, to stop uh, thinking uh, in dollars? Is that possible? Uh, so how would you recommend uh, to do that? What, 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 what would be your recommendations? Well, uh, in Argentina, um, there are different aspects. First, uh, there are first uh, very, um, very few instruments in peso in which we, you can put your money. One, uh, one first big point is, is to have more uh, instruments uh, that pay, uh, that uh, gives, give you a good return in, in, in pesos. Then there is the, um, one thing that is very hard to solve is the one instrument that you usually put your money is housing, right? You, 
everybody one saving instrument is housing, but you need dollars to pay. In this country, you need dollars to buy housing, to buy houses. So uh, a very, very uh, important fight is to have houses denominated in pesos, but that will require a, a, a structural change. Third, you need to, to change the, the saving practices and financial practices of companies. Companies have a, they, they have a lot of liquidity in dollars. So you also need to change that to make them have more liquidity in peso assets. It's, um, I think that the current government is starting to reveal a peso, a, a peso debt market. They are becoming successful in that, but it's very small uh, still. So uh, it will take a lot of time. It will take a lot of time. <clears throat> just, just to expand briefly on this, uh, we started uh, this webinar with uh, the issue of uh, the hierarchy of money uh, yes. and why if countries cannot borrow in their own currency, they have to go to uh, the dollar of, or the euro, uh, which yes. creates problems because they, they need this foreign currency to repay the debt. If, the, if there's an outflow, their currency becomes less valuable against the other currency, so they need more of, yes. their, of their currency to repay to repay the debt. Um, and so th th that's why the IMF has been advocating for a long time that you can have uh, free markets, uh, free flowing capital flows, uh, as long as developing countries start to develop uh, their domestic uh, debt mm. markets. Uh, yes. Uh, but what 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 has the current crisis? Uh, shown us about the, the domestic. Uh, uh, the, the crisis has shown us that it is not enough. It's better, but not enough to have a domestic market denominated in your own currency. It's better than to have it denominated in dollars, yes, for sure, but it's not enough. Uh, the presence of uh, foreign investors is also a very important factor because foreign investors, all, most of the outflows, that we have been experienced, they left out of domestic currency market. Mm -hmm. So that also creates a lot of instability. So it shows the need for capital controls in this. Yes. So in the end, uh, it's, it is, we have to uh, remember that it's uh, the global liquidity or the global wall of money, massive money that moves in and out of markets. And it goes also in and out of domestic bonds as, as yes. it does from, from other uh, bond markets. So th this solution that the IMF was proposing, uh, well, this crisis sh showed that it was not a real solution when it comes to a crisis. It was tested by the crisis and it, well, it didn't work. Uh, it, um, it has flaws, I would say. I would say that it has flaws. Uh, particular, um, it's still better than dollar mm. debt. I mean, yeah. no question about it but it still needs a lot of improvements and, and modifications uh, regarding inflows and outflows. Uh, it's not enough as, as, it is, as it currently stands. No, uh, it creates other vulnerabilities. Would you like to ask the last question, uh, Sarah? Yeah, I think so, because it's already almost five o'clock. Time is flying when you're having fun. So um, there's two questions that are related to central banking policy in the Global South. Um, and I try to ask them at once. One is by Juliana Bolzani. Uh, is monetary financing something to worry about when central banks in Latin America start to do QE operations and corporate asset purchases? That's one question. And the other one is again by uh, Ruben Alderete. Uh, what monetary policies can the central banks implement considering the balance of payments constraint? So I, I presume this is also about central banks in Latin America. So maybe you have um, uh, like a uh, note to end on if it comes to the role of central banks in Latin America. Uh, well, I think uh, I will reply them uh, together. Um, central banks can have uh, the best monetary policies to have a differentiated monetary policy to target different sectors uh, with um, different credit conditions, to start um, favoring um, credit for investment, to start fun uh, instead of speculative borrowing, which happens a lot, uh, to start um, 
uh, providing relatively stable returns to savers, but uh, at the same time to have through other mechanisms, through other um, with other financial instruments, to start supporting uh, a investment, a green investment to make, to favor um, public and private green finance. Uh, they, they can have a, a, an important role to play in the, in their um, in their domestic economies, uh, but it requires a rethink. Um, perhaps copying some, not all, of the ideas that uh, I mean, the topic is very much discussed in the north, but uh, they can. Uh, the, there is there are a lot of ideas that they can apply for uh, for the south as well and could could have a positive impact. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. I'm afraid we have to wrap up, but we managed to um, ask you almost all the questions uh, from the Q&A session, which is really nice. Uh, and thank you for your interesting view. I think it's very good that we, we've added this perspective to crash course because uh, yeah, mostly when you read about monetary policy and its effects uh, in the newspapers in the Netherlands or other European countries, it's only about uh, is inequality going up or down in, in Europe? And you don't really read much about the effects on the global south. Um, and we don't know also much about central banks in Latin America. So yeah, really interesting uh, to share your view. And I think it also relates very well to the, the power structures that we discussed last week with Benjamin Brown, which we see here again uh, with the role of the IMF, for example, in, uh, in the Argentina crisis. So thank you very much. Uh, my you pleasure. Know, yes, you need to know as um, uh, attendee that you can uh, watch this webinar online uh, once we've put it there uh, next week. We'll also put a podcast version there and a transcript of this session. Um, and thank you very much for participating in the already third webinar of Crash Course. Uh, we have a next and uh, last session before the summer break next week. Um, which will be uh, addressing the question whether monetary policy can be applied to uh, avoid austerity. Um, it will be broadcast on the 3rd of July at 4 o'clock, starring Daniela Gabor, who is a professor of economics and macro finance in Bristol. Uh, so I hope you will be able uh, to join. Um, and then last but not least, you can sign up for our newsletter, um, which I will so show you in a second. Right, so this is our lovely website made by Jeremy. Uh, this is the fourth session. You can sign up now by clicking on sign up. And if you go to the Wayne website, uh, you can see um, here recordings from our first, second, and then also the third session next week. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, thank you again, Pablo. And also thank you very much, Rodrigo. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.